Good evening and welcome back to my channel. I'm your loyal Hufflepuff, and today we will continue our reading in Flora and Ulysses by Kate De Camillo. This is gonna be, this is our first children's book. There is a Disney Plus movie out that came out, I think it was about a year or two ago, based off the same title, and I thought the movie was really cute, and I read the book. The book I thought was really cute as well. So, it's really great. It's recommended for kids ages 8 to, eight to 12 years old. And so far, I've been enjoying this book with you guys. If you guys are enjoying this, with, are enjoying this book as well, please like and subscribe to my channel for more stuff. And... If you want to talk more about this book, please make a comment down below. And without further ado, let us continue reading Flora and Ulysses. Once I get there. All right. Chapter 19. He sat in front of the machine. It was different from Flora's mother's typewriter. There was a blank screen instead of paper, and the whole contraption glowed, emitting a warm but not entirely friendly smell. The keyboard was familiar. Though each of the letters was there, each of them in the same place, Flor and Tootie stood behind him, and William Spiver, the boy with the dark glass with dark glasses, stood behind him too. This was an important moment. Ulysses understood that very well. Everything depended on him, typing something. He had to do it for Flora. His whiskers trembled. He could feel them trembling. He could see them trembling. What could he do? He turned and sniffed his tail. There was nothing he could do except to be himself, to try to make the letters on the keyboard speak the truth of his heart, to work to make them reveal the essence of the squirrel he was. But what was the truth? And what kind of squirrel was he? He looked around the room. There was a tall window, and outside the window was the green, green world and the blue sky. Inside were shelves and shelves of books, and on the wall above the keyboard was a picture of a man and woman floating over a city. They were suspended in golden light. The man was holding the woman, and she had one arm flung out in front of her, as if she as if she were pointing the way home. Ulysses liked the woman's face. She reminded him of Flora. Looking at the painting made the squirrel feel warm inside, certain of something. Whoever had painted the picture loved the floating man and the floating woman. He loved the city that floated above. He loved the golden light. Just as Ulysses loved the green world outside and the blue sky and Flora's round head his whiskers stopped trembling. What's happening? asked William Spiver. Nothing, said Flora. He's gone into some kind of trance, said Tootie. Shh, said Flora. Ulysses inched closer to the keyboard. Yep, there he is. He's going to get a little bit closer to the keyboard. And, oh, by the way, all these, are these pictures that I've been showing you were illustrated by K.G. Campbell. So very. So I'll do a little bit more digging and see what other illustrations she's done. I'm going to assume that she's done illustrations for like B, well, probably not BFG, but because of Win Dixie and other books that she's done. But they're very cute. They're very good, very good art pieces. That was oh, here's another one. It says here. It was a beautiful. It was beautiful, to the squirrel to see a letter appear out of nowhere. Well, what is it? What's the letter? It's an I, William Spiver. But that proves nothing, of course. Anyone can inadvertently hit an I. You don't have to be a superhero to type an I. Would you please hush, William? The squirrel typed. The people waited. Destiny bestirred itself. That was the end of chapter 19. And here's some more artwork right there. Show that he's typing on that computer. 
because they're cute, huh? All right, chapter 20. I love your round head, the brilliant green, the watching blue, these letters, this world, you. I am very, very hungry. End of chapter 20. Chapter 21. They were sitting in Tootie's office. Tootie was on the couch with a package of frozen peas on her head. She had fainted. Un she had fainted. Unfortunately, she had hit her head on the edge of the desk on the way down. Fortunately, Flora had remembered an issue of terrible things can happen to you. Advising that a bag of frozen peas made an excellent, excellent cold compress to provide comfort and reduce swelling. Read it one more time, said William Spiffer to Flora. Flora read Ulysses, Ulysses' words aloud, aloud again. The squirrel wrote poetry, said Tootie in a voice filled with wonder. Keep these peas on your head, said Flora. I don't get the last part, said William Spiffer. The part about hunger. What does that mean? Flora turned away from the computer and looked at William Spiffer's dark glasses and saw, again, her round-headed, pajama self reflected there. It means he's hungry, she said. He hasn't had any breakfast. Oh, said William Spiver. I see. It's literal. Ulysses was sitting on his hind legs beside the computer. He nodded hopefully. It's poetry, said Tootie from the couch. Ulysses puffed out his chest at just the tiniest bit. Well, it might be poetry, said William Spiver, but it's not great poetry. It's not even good poetry. But what does that this all mean? said Tootie. Why does it why does it have to mean something? said William Spiver. The universe is a random place. Oh, for heaven's sake, William, said Tootie. Flora felt something well up inside her inside of her. What was it? Pride in the squirrel, annoyance at William Spiver, wonder, hope. Suddenly, she remembered the words that appeared over Alfred T.'s head when he was submerged in a vat of incandesto. It says here, do you doubt him? Do not. And that's the little comic strip right there of him in the vat there. Very cute. Do you doubt him, said Flora? Of course I doubt him, said William Spiver. Do not, said Flora. Why, said William Spiver. She stared at him. Take off your glasses, she said. I want to see your eyes. No, said William Spiver. Take them off. I won't. Children, said Tootie, please. Who was William Spiver really? Yes. Yes, he was the great nephew of Tootie Tickham, suddenly suspiciously, come to stay the summer. But who was he really? What if he was some kind of comic book character himself? What if he was a villain whose powers were depleted as soon as the light of the world hit his eyes? Incandesto was forever being attacked by his arch nemesis, the darkness of 10,000 hands. Every superhero had an arch nemesis. What if Ulysses' Ulysses' arch nemesis was William Spiver? <clears throat> the truth must be known, said Flora. She stepped forward. She reached out her hand to remove William Spiver's glasses. And then she heard her name. Flora Bell, your father's here. Flora Bell, said William Spiver in a gentle voice. Ulysses was still sitting on his hind legs. His ears were pricked. He looked back and forth between Flora and William Spiver. We have to go, uh, said Flora. Wait, said William Spiver. Flora picked Ulysses up by the scruff of his neck. She put him under the, her pajama top. Will I ever see you again, said William Spiffer. The universe is a random place, William Spiffer, said Flora. Who can say whether we will meet again or not? 
end of chapter 21. <clears throat> My throat's a little dry. Okay. All right. Chapter 22. Her father was standing on the top step in front of, in the, in front of the open door. He was wearing a dark suit and a tie and a hat with a brim. Even though it, it was Saturday in summertime, Flora's father was an accountant at the firm Flinton, Flawston, and Frick. Flora wasn't sure, but she thought it was possible that her father was the world's loneliest man. He didn't even have Incandesto and Dolores to keep him company anymore. Hi, Pop, she said. Flora said her father. He smiled at her, and then he sighed. I'm not ready yet. Oh, that's okay, said her father. He sighed again. I'll wait. He walked with Flora into the living room. He sat down on the couch. He took off his hat and balanced it on his knee. Are you in the house now, George? Flora's mother shouted from the kitchen. Is Flora with you? I am inside, shouted Flora's father. Flora is with me. The clack, clack, clack of the typewriter echoed through the house. Silverware rattled, and then there was silence. What are you doing, George? Her mother shouted. I am sitting on the couch, couch for this. I am waiting for my daughter. Flora's father moved his hat from his left knee to his right knee, and then back to his left knee again. Ulysses shifted underneath Flora's pajamas. What are you two going to do today? Flora's mother shouted. I don't know, Phyllis. I can hear you perfectly well, George, said Flora's mother as she came into the living room. You don't need to shout. Flora, what have you got under your pajama top? Nothing, said Flora. Is it that squirrel? No, said Flora. What squirrel, said Flora's father. Don't lie to me, said her mother. Okay, said Flora. It's a squirrel. I'm keeping him. I knew it. I knew you were hiding something. Listen to me. That squirrel is diseased. You're engaging in dangerous behavior. Flora turned away. She had a superhero under her pajamas. She didn't have to listen to her mother, or anybody else for that matter. A new day was dawning. A girl with a superhero kind of day. I'm going to change now, she said. This will not work, Flora Bell, said her mother. That squirrel is not staying. What squirrels, said Flora's father again. Flora went halfway up the stairs, and then she stopped. She stood on the landing. The criminal element suggested that anyone truly invested in fighting crime, investing in criminals, should learn to listen carefully. All words at all times. True or false. Whispered or shouted are clues to the workings of the human heart. Listen, you must, if you care to understand anything at all, become a giant ear. This was what the criminal element suggested, and this was what Flora intended to do. She put Ulysses out from underneath her pajama top. Sit on my shoulder, she whispered to him. Ulysses climbed up on her shoulder. Listen, she said. He nodded. Flora felt brave and capable, standing there on the landing with her squirrel on her shoulder. Do not hope, she whispered. Instead, observe. She took a deep breath and let it out slowly. She held, her, she held herself absolutely still. She became a giant ear. And what Flora the giant ear heard was astonishing. End of chapter 22, beginning of chapter 23. George, said Flora's mother, we have a problem. Your daughter has become emotionally attached to a diseased squirrel. How's that? said Flora's father. There's a squirrel, said her mother, speaking more slowly now, as if she were pointing at each word as she said it. There's a squirrel, repeated the, her father. The squirrel is not well. There's an unwell squirrel. There's a sack in the garage and a shovel. Okay, said Flora's father. There's a sack and a shovel in the garage. At this point, there was a very long silence. 
I need you to put the squirrel out of its misery, said Flora's mother. How's that? said her father. How's that? said her father. For the love of Pete, George, shouted her mother. Put the squirrel in the sack and then hit him over the head with the shovel. Flora's, Flora's father gasped. Flora's, Flora gasped too. She was su surprised at herself. The ladies, the ladies in her mother's romance novels put their hands on their bosoms and gasped. But Flora was not a gasper. She was a cynic. Flora's father said, I don't understand. Flora's mother cleared her throat. She uttered the blood-soaked words again. She said them louder. She said them more slowly. You put the squirrel in the sack, George. You hit the squirrel over the head with the shovel. She paused. And then, she said, you used the shovel to bury the squirrel. Put the squirrel in, the, in a sack? Hit the squirrel over the head with a shovel? Said Flora's father in a squeaky, despairing voice. Oh, Phyllis. Oh, Phyllis, no. Yes, said Flora's mother. It's the hum humane thing to do. Flora understood that she had made a mistake in thinking that William Spiver was anybody important. Everything was coming into sharp and terrifying focus. The story was starting to make sense. Ulysses was a superhero, probably, and Phyllis Buckham, Buckman was his arch nemesis. Definitely. Holy unanticipated occurrences. And here's a picture of Flora's mom telling Flora's dad to try to get rid of the squirrel. And those are the feet of Flora overhearing that conversation. So, not looking good so far. But Flora is very protective of the squirrel, Ulysses. So let's continue reading. Chapter 24. He should have been shocked, but he wasn't. Not really. It was a sad fact of his existence as a squirrel that there was always someone, somewhere, who wanted him dead. In his short life, Ulysses had been stalked by cats, attacked by raccoons, and shot at with BB guns, slingshots, and a bow and arrow. And a bow and arrow. Granted, the arrow was made of rubber, but still, it had hurt. He had been shouted at threatened, and poisoned. He had been flung ears over tail by the stream of water issuing from a garden hose turned to full force. Once at the public picnic grounds, a small girl had tried to beat him to death with her enormous teddy bear. And last fall, a pickup truck had run over his tail. Truthfully, the possibility of getting hit over the head with a shovel didn't seem, to seem that alarming. Life was dangerous, particularly if, particularly if you were a squirrel. In any case, he wasn't thinking about dying. He was thinking about poetry. That's what Tootie said he had written. Poetry. He liked the, the word. Its smallness, its density, the way it rose up at the end of... and as if it had wings. Poetry. Don't worry, said Flora. You're a superhero. The, <clears throat> this malfeasance will be stopped. Ulysses dug his claws into Flora's pajamas to keep his balance on his shoulder. Malfeasance, Malf said Flora again. Poetry, thought Ulysses. And yes, this is the end of chapter 24. There's Flora and Ulysses right there. Ulysses is on his shoulder. Very cool, very nice artistic -y. Artistic, very artistic. Chapter 25. Flora's father, father's car seat smelled like butterscotch and ketchup, and Flora was in the back seat, where the smell of butterscotch and ketchup was the most powerful. She had a, she had a Bootsy Boots, Bootsy Boots shoebox with Ulysses in it on her lap, and she was feeling carsick even though the car wasn't moving yet. 
She was also feeling the tiniest bit overwhelmed. Things in general were pretty confusing. For instance, here was Ulysses sitting in a shoebox, knowing that there was a shovel in the trunk of the car and that the man driving the car had been instructed to whack him over the head with his, the shovel. And the squirrel didn't look worried or afraid. He looked happy. And then there was Flora's mother, the person who had given Flora the shoebox to protect your little friend on his journey. We'll just put this washcloth in here as a comfy blanket. She was standing at the door, smiling and waving goodbye to them as if she weren't truly a murder-planning arch-nemesis. Talk about the darkness of 10,000 hands. Nothing was as it seemed. Flora looked down at the squirrel. Of course, he was not what he seemed either, and that was a good thing, an incandesto thing. Flora felt a shiver of belief, of, poss of possibility, pass through her, passed through her. Her parents had no idea what kind of squirrel they were dealing with. Her father put the car in reverse as he backed out of the driveway. Flora saw William Spiffer standing in Tootsie, Tootsie's front yard. Tootie's front yard. He was looking up at the sky. He turned his head slowly in the direction of the car. His glasses flashed in the sun. Judy appeared. She was waving one of the pink gloves as if it were a flag of surrender. Stop the car, she shouted. Step on the gas, Flora said to her father. She did not want to talk to Tootie, and she definitely did not want to talk to William Spiffer. She didn't want to see herself reflected in his dark glasses. She had her own thoughts about the random and confusing nature of the universe. She didn't need this. She didn't need his, too. Also, she was in a hurry. There was a murder to stop, a superhero to mentor, failings to vanquish, darkness to eradicate. She couldn't waste time trading stupid thoughts with William Spiver. Flora Bell said, shouted William Spiver, almost as if he were reading it her mind. I've had some interesting thoughts. He ran toward the car and fell into the bushes. Great Aunt Tootie, she, he shouted, I need your assistance. What in the world is going on, said her father. He slammed on the brakes. It's just a temporarily blind boy, said Flora, and Mrs. Tickham from next door. She's his aunt, his great aunt. Never mind, it doesn't make any difference. Keep going. But it was too late. Tootie had helped William Spiffer out of the bushes, and the two of them were walking toward the car. William Spiffer was smiling. Hello, her father called out to them. I'm George Buckham, Buckman. What do you do? Flora's father introduced himself to everyone all the time, even if the person was someone he had already met. It was an annoying and extremely persistent habit. Hello, sir, said William Spiffer. I am Lim William Spiff Spiffer. I would like to speak to your daughter, Flora Bell. I don't have time to talk to you right now, William Spiver, said Flora. Great Aunt Tootie, can, can you assist me? Will you take me to Flora's side of the vehicle? Please excuse me while I escort this, this extremely disturbed and neurotic child to the other side of the car, said Tootie. Certainly, certainly, said Flora's father. And then he said to absolutely no one, George Bookman, how do you do? Flora sighed. She looked down at Ulysses, considering the, hum the human beings she was surrounded by. Believing in a squirrel seemed like an, inc an increasingly reasonable plan of action. <sighs> Ugh. I wanted to apologize, said William Spiver, who was now standing beside her window. For what, said Flora? It was the worst poetry I've ever heard. Oh, said Flora. Also, I am s I'm sorry that I wouldn't take my glasses off when you asked me to. Take them off now then, said Flora. I can't, said William Spiffer. They've been glued to my head by evil forces beyond my control. 
You lie, said Flora. Yes, no, I don't. I do. I'm engaging in hyperbole. It seems as if the glasses had been glued to my head. He lowered his voice. Actually, I'm afraid that if I, if I take my glasses off, the whole world will unravel. That's stupid, said Flora. There are bigger things to worry about. For instance... Flora realized she was going to say something to William Spiffer that she didn't, she hadn't intended to say. The words were out of her mouth before she could stop them. Do you know what an arch nemesis is? She whispered. Of course I do. William Spiffer whispered back. Right, said Flora. Well, Ulysses has got one. It's my mother. William Spiffer's eyebrows rose up above his dark glasses. Flora was pleased to note that he looked properly surprised and shocked. Speaking of Ulysses, said Tootie, I have some poetry that I would like to recite to him. Are you sure that now is the time for a poetry recitation, said William Spiffer. Ulysses sat up straighter in his bootsy boots box, shoe box. He looked at Tootie. He nodded. I was moved by your poetry, said Tootie to the squirrel. Ulysses puffed out his chest. And I have some poetry that I would like to recite to you in honor of the recent um, transformations in your life. Tootie put a hand on her chest. This is Rilke, she said. You sent out beyond your recall. Go to the limits of your longing. Embody me flare up like flame and make big shadows I can move in. Ulysses stared up at Tootie, his eyes bright. Flare up like flame? Said Flora's father from the front seat. That is moving, yes. That is quite lovely, flaring up like flame. Thank you so much. We have to be on our, on our way now. But will you return? Said William Spiver. Here's the book. Let's see, what is that? Angelo Joy's Keith Shelley Wild. So it's a book that she's currently reading. And you can see Ulysses and the boy, William Spiffer, in the background, as well as her father. So it looks pretty nice. I wonder what they're thinking. Come on. Some of these pages get stuck sometimes. Oh, never mind. I must be a little tired, huh? Flora looked up and saw William Spiffer's words hanging in the air above him like a small, tethered flag. But will you return? I'm just spending the afternoon with my father, William Spiffer said. She, William Spiffer, she, she said. It's not like I'm heading off to the South Pole. Terrible things can happen to you. I had done an extensive piece on what to do if you were stranded at the South Pole. Their advice could be summed up in three simple words. Eat seal blubber. Eat seal, eat seal blubber. It was astonishing, really, what people could live through. Four felt cheered up all of a sudden. Just thinking about eating seal blubber and doing impossible things, surviving when the odds were against her and her squirrel. They would figure out a way to outwit the arch nemesis. They would triumph over the shovel and the sack, and they would triumph together, like Dolores and in Incandesto. I'm glad, said William Spiver. I'm glad that you're not going to the South Pole, Flora Bell. Flora's father cleared his throat. George Bookman, he said, how do you do? It was nice to meet you, sir, said William Spiver. Remember those words, said Tootie. Flare up like flame, said Flora's father. I was speaking to the squirrel, said Tootie. Of course, said Flora's father. My apologies, the squirrel. I will see you again, said William Spiver. Beware the arch nemesis, said Flora. I will see you again, said William Spiver. We're off to fight evil, 
said Flora as her father backed the car out of the driveway. William Spiffer waved at the chair. I will see you again. He seemed so stuck on the idea of seeing her again that Flora didn't have the heart to tell him that he was waving in the wrong direction. End of chapter 25. Excuse me. Now we begin chapter 26. Flora's father was a careful driver. He kept his left hand at 10 o'clock on the steering wheel and his right hand at 2. He never, looked, took, he never took his eyes off the road. He did not go fast. Speed, her father said often. Her father often said, That is what will kill you. That and taking your eyes off the road. Never, ever take your eyes off the road. Pop, said Flora, I need to talk to you. Okay, said her father. He kept his eyes on the road. About what? That sack and that shovel. What sack, said her father. What shovel? It occurred to Flora that her father would make an excellent spy. He never really answered questions. Instead, when asked a question, he simply responded with an nifty sidestep or a question of his own. For instance, when her parents were getting their divorce, Flora had a conversation with her father that went something like this. Flora, are you and mom getting divorced? Flora's father. Who says we're getting divorced? Flora. Mom. Flora's father. Is that what she said? Flora. That's what she said. Flora's father. I wonder why she said that. And then he started to cry. Spies probably didn't cry, but still, there's a sack and a shovel in the trunk of the car, Pop, said Flora. Is there? said her father. I saw you put them in there. It's true. I did put a sack and a shovel in the trunk of a car of the car. The criminal element said that if it, that it was a good idea to engage in relentless, open minded questions questioning. If you question with enough ferocity, people are sometimes surprised into answering questions that they do not intend to answer. When in doubt, question, question more, question faster. Why, said Flora. I intend to dig a hole, said her father. For what, said Flora. A thing that I'm going to bury. What are you going to bury? A sack. What are you... Bearing a, why are you bearing a sack? Because your mother asked me to. Why did she ask you to hurry to bury a sack? Her father tapped her, his fingers on the steering wheel. Ah. Her father tapped his fingers on the steering wheel. He stared straight ahead. Why did she ask me to bury a sack? Why did she ask me to bury a sack? That's a good one. Hey, I know. Do you want to get something to eat? What? Said Flora. How about some lunch? Said her father. For the love of Pete, said Flora. Or some breakfast? How about we stop and eat a meal? My meal. Any meal. Flora sighed. The criminal element advised stalling, delaying, and obfuscation of every possible sort when it came to dealing with a criminal. Her father wasn't a criminal, not exactly, but he had been enlisted in the service of villainy. Basically, he was in cahoots with an arch nemesis, so maybe it would be good to stall, not to stall, to delay the inevitable showdown. The inevitable showdown, there it is. By going into a restaurant. Besides, the squirrel was hungry. And he would need to be and he would need to be strong for the little for the battle ahead. Okay, said Flora. Okay, sure. Let's eat. Chapter twenty seven. Okay, sure, let's eat. What a wonderful what wonderful words those are, thought Ulysses. Let's eat. Talk about poet poetry. 
The squirrel was happy. He was happy because he was with Flora. And he was happy because he had the words from Tootie's poem flowing through his head and heart. He was happy because he was going to he was going to be fed soon. And he was happy because he was, well, happy. He climbed out of the shoebox and put his front paws on the door and his nose Oh, uh, uh, and his, oh, where are we, yeah, and, and his nose out the open window. He was a squirrel riding in a car on a summer day with someone he loved. His whiskers and nose were in the breeze, and there were so many smells. Overflowing trash cans just cut grass. Sun warm patches of pavement, the loamy richness of dirt, earthworms, loamy smelling too, often difficult to distinguish from the smell of dirt. Dog, more dog, <clears throat> dog again. Oh, dogs, small dogs, large dogs, foolish dogs. The torturing of dogs was the one reliable pressure of a squirrel's existence. The tang of fertilizer, a faint whiff of birdseed, something baking, the hidden, hang on. <clears throat> what was that, oh yeah. Something baking, the hidden hint of nuttiness, pecan, acorn, the small apologetic don't mind me odor of mouse, and the ruthless stench of cat. Cats were terrible. Cats were never to be trusted. Never. The world in all its smelly glory, in all its treachery and joy and nuttiness, washed over Ulysses, over Ulysses, ran through him, filled him, he could smell everything. He could even smell the blue of the sky. He wanted to capture it. He wanted to write it down. He wanted to tell Flora. He turned and looked at her. Keep your eyes open for malfeasance, she said to him. Ulysses nodded. The words from Tootie's poem sounded in his head. Flare up like flame? Flare up like flame. Yes, he thought. That's what I'll do. I'll flare up like flame. And I'll write it all down. End of chapter 27. Just doing a double check. Come on. Oh yeah, it's 68. That's what I thought. Okay. Chapter 28. You have to leave the squirrel in the car, said Flora's father, as he pulled into the parking lot of the giant dew nut. No, said Flora, it's too hot. I'll leave the windows down, said her father. Someone will steal them will steal him. You think someone would steal him? Her father sounded doubtful, but help but hopeful. Who would steal a squirrel? A criminal, said Flora. The criminal element spoke often and passionately about the nefarious activities that every human being is capable of. Not only did it insist that the human heart was dark beyond all reckoning, it was also likened to the heart to a river. And further, it said, if you're not careful, the river can carry us along in its hidden currents of want and anger and need and transform and transform each of us into the very criminal we fear. The human heart is a deep, dark river with hidden currents, Flora said to her father. Criminals are everywhere. Her father tapped his fingers on the steering wheel. I wish I could di disagree with you, but I can't. Ulysses sneezed. Bless you, said her father. I'm not leaving him, said Flora. Alfred T. Slipper took his parakeet, Dolores. 
with with him everywhere, sometimes even to the offices of the Paxa Tocket Life Insurance Company. Not everyone, <clears throat> not without my parakeet. That was what Alfred said. Not without my squirrel, said Flora. If her father recognized the sentence, if the words reminded him of their time together reading about Incandesto, he didn't show it. He merely sighed. Bring him in, then, he said. But keep the lid on the shoebox. Ulysses climbed into the shoebox, and Flora dutifully lowered the lid on his small face. Okay, she said. All right. She climbed out of the car, and then she stood and looked up at the giant do not sign. Giant do nuts inside. The sign screamed in neon letters, while an extremely large donut appeared over and over again into a cup of coffee. But there was no hand on the donut. Who, Flora wondered, is doing the deep the dunking a small shiver ran down her spine what if what if we are all donuts just waiting to be to be dunked she thought it was the kind of question that William Spiver would ask she could hear him ask asking it it was also the kind of question that William Spiver would have would have an answer for that was the thing about William Spiffer. He always had an answer, even if it was an annoying one. Listen to me, she whispered to the shoebox. You are not you are not a donut waiting to be dunked. You are a superhero. Do not let yourself to be, be tricked or fooled. Remember the shovel. Keep an eye on George Beck Buckman. <clears throat> Her father got out of the car. She pulled his hands in his pockets and jingled his change. Shall we? He said. Still, stall, delay, obfuscate. Let's, said Flora. That was the end of chapter 28. We'll go ahead and stop here for right now. Um, I'm going, uh, like I said before, I'm going to be doing 10 chapters per, per round. I know the last one was about, we had about 20 about 20 chapters but we are going to be reading more chapters as we go with 68 chapters <coughs> that's roughly about a good six days about a week's time which is not a bad deal um i'll keep on reading this book to you guys um it's very cute very adorable in fact did i show you that last picture oh no there was no picture Never mind. Ah, wait a minute. Wait a minute. There was a picture. Okay. So before I end this video, I want to show you the little picture right here. See the the girl there, uh, carrying the shoebox with the Ulysses and the donut shop. Very cool. Very cute. So, yep, that's the. That was the end of chapter 28. So we are, we've gotten a lot of reading done tonight. And that was just 10 chapters. Very quick, very easy read. Um, so yeah, in about a week's time, we'll be, we'll be done with this book. And I will do my best to get a, to do a comparison on this book and the movie. Um, I know I'm, I'm still working on the comparison of the first, um, the first book of Shadow and Bone and a comparison to the series. That is a series I am looking for. Um, that's an episode I'm looking forward to telling you guys, because I will have my wife who will be a guest on here and she will She'll give you her opinion about viewing, watching the show without reading the book and then me reading the, having read the book and then watched the show. So I'm looking forward to you guys 
to that episode. Hopefully we'll do that tomorrow. If not, then I'm hoping to get that one done tomorrow. If not, there will be another time. But until then, I hope you all enjoyed this. If you have any questions about what we're, we've been reading, if you guys have any thoughts about what we just read, please make, a comment, make your comments down below. Also, if you guys um, would... If you guys want more reading, more books to be read, this is a kid's book, by the way, and I'm making sure that this is for kids, that kids can't are allowed to read this to, you know, they're allowed to read it or listen to it. This book has is allowed for kids, is recommended for kids ages 8 to 12 years old. So, very, very easy read, um, very short chapters. And like I, like I said, we did, we, and just now we did 10 chapters in about 45 minutes. So that's not a bad, that's not bad timing at all. So if you guys are interested in this book, please comment down below. If you've seen the movie and have read the book, please comment about that down below as well. Also, I'm looking forward to reading our Christmas book, which is going to be coming up soon for a Christmas special. I will keep on reading this as well as the Storm and Siege. So I'm hoping you guys will all enjoy that as well. As I'm as I continue read as I'm continuing reading this book and this the trilogy. So until then, um, I hope you all have had a had a wonderful Thanksgiving day, and see you all in the next video. I'm the Loyal Hufflepuff. And I hope you all have a blessed night.